Awesome. And Stephanie? I'm Stephanie Stukrath. Um, my husband and I, we farm in northeast Nebraska, um, north of Norfolk, about an hour. And um, I purchased my first gamel in 2009, 2009, from Sue Kleinschmidt. And um, 2019, I traded that one off. And it's a silly reason why, but I wanted a painted machine. <laughs> and um, I was going to get a second machine and my husband just suggested, why don't you trade yours off and get two painted ones because I couldn't decide on which color to get. So I have two 14-foot um, Statlers. One I upgraded to the Ascend two years ago, I believe it was. And what are the two colors? Um, one is the really pretty red, the sparkly red, and the other one's like a sapphire blue. Awesome. I know it's so hard to decide on that. And hopefully someday you'll be able to go back to the painted ones because I think that was a fun option to have, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to start with Stephanie and then, uh, and then we'll do Naomi. Um, I already know what part of the country you're from. Um, and you said you got your first machine in 2009. So that means you've got almost 15 years into long arm quilting. Is that correct? Actually, I, in 2004, um, I purchased a domestic long arm, you could say, um, and it was strictly hand guided. I'm not going to say the name of it, but mm -hmm. it was not a gamble and um, mainly just to do my own quilts and um, word got out. I had the machine and before I knew it, I had a business. It kind of just fell into me and um Early 2009, I started seriously looking at um, getting a heavy-duty commercial-grade machine that could withstand the um, all the quilts I was putting through on my other machine. I could see that that other one was just not going to last um, for running a commercial business with it. And so then I looked at the gamel and went and, um, went and looked at one and called Kathy and mm -hmm. Sue Kleinschmidt, ordered one, went and did my training, drove out there in the literally a black blackout blizzard to get to get to the training. Um, but it was a great time. And at that time in 2009, there really wasn't education for the machine. It was just kind of hit and miss. And um, what made you decide to long arm on that? So the first one that you got, you know, that was we'll count that one because you went from a sit down quilting, you know, straight lines or whatever, uh, to a machine that would roll around on a table. What made you decide to go to that? To that one, um, probably the price was the big thing. We're in farming agriculture. We um, had kids and stuff um, and could not justify spending the money on the gamble at the time and so I not knowing if I was going to enjoy it and um didn't take long and I became pretty proficient prof, prof, whatever pretty um competent pretty good at the, it at the freehand quilting and um realized that the computer would be just that would free up some time to do other things prep quilts while the machine was running so Statler. when you got your first gamble then, was it a Statler right out of the gate? So you went from the kind of. I went, yeah. yeah, I went um, straight to the 14 foot table um, Statler 30, 30 inch head. It was the optimum, I think, at the time and um, hung on to the other one thinking, oh, I could do it. And probably about five weeks later, I decided I just don't want the other one around and sold it privately and mm -hmm. and um, never looked back. So what was behind the choice to get a gamble? Is it just that it was um, nearby and you could go see one or did you check out a bunch of different ones before you uh, plunked down the money for a Statler? I checked out another one which was located in the Omaha area. The gamble, the only way I could really check that one out was the information that was mailed to me. The closest dealer was Wisconsin and we're in Nebraska mm -hmm. at the time. Um, 
Columbia West Plains was not an option when I called the main office that they sent me to Schmidt. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, the computer components, the, the, um, the Statler software was probably what really sold me on that. The larger bobbin size, the heavy duty, um, roll rollers. Mm -hmm. yeah. But had you seen one before you bought it? Um, I knew someone that had a machine and I'd look gotcha. at it. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so you you cooked through a bunch of my questions early on. So you do have the same one today, but you added a second one and then one of them got the ascend upgrade. Yes. Mm -hmm. How did you know there was enough long arm business available in your area to support another long arm quilter? You knew it because as soon as you got your first little hand guided machine, you had people pouring in. Tell me about how that happened. Um, visited with, um, a girlfriend had a quilt shop in Norfolk and visited with her and, um, she put my business cards in her shop. I would quilt a quilt for her each year. And, um, then there, and there was also a small shop in Osmond at the time, which is no longer there. And, um, yeah, it's, it was amazing word of mouth. People just knew you did it and, and I would quilt for them. Um, when I got the Statler, the business really picked up because um, the stitch quality was so much nicer, the precision on it. You could um, actually quilt more quilts quicker than by hand guiding. Um, you know, it was, I don't know, there's just a lot of um, nice tips and nice features on the camel that made it so much easier and more efficient to quilt. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did you come up with the funds to purchase that machine? That was not a small investment. Um, the sale of the other machine helped. And um, my husband just said, go talk to the banker. So I took out a three-year note at the bank and um, paid it off early. It was, easy to, it, it was easy to pay it off early. I was amazed. Um, with that. When I bought my second one here in 2019, I had saved up enough. I had enough in savings to cover that one. Mm -hmm. So when you first got the Statler uh, and you were looking to, you know, make a significant upgrade, what was your husband's opinion? Obviously he didn't stand against it. He helped you with it, but what did he have to say? He was all for it. He'd known that um, ever since before we were married, that sewing was in my blood. I used to do bridal apparel, um, window treatments, alterations, all that type of stuff as a stay-at-home mom on the farm. So when, um, when we were first married, he was farming with his dad, so I could pretty well raise our children and I would just take in odd little jobs occasionally doing that and if not I was always sewing for myself or Lutheran World Relief quilts um, that type of project so it was just he yeah he was always for it he really couldn't say anything because he kind of has a um, interest in a lot of green paint and dirt so <laughs> it, um, when I wanted something, he never squabbled or anything. It's like, yeah, go for it. So, mm -hmm. well, he under, he understands buying good equipment and the investment that it takes, but also the fact that it's, it's often worth the investment, right? It generally is. Yes. So, yes. Um, so with all these other things you were doing, it doesn't sound like you had another, um, full-time or part-time job along with the long arming because you had a lot of volunteer things and other things around the farm. Is that correct? That's correct. I've known too many, and I might be old school this way. I've known too many um, people out there that, that want a family and then they abandon their kids to daycare. And it's like, if you're going to have the kids spend the time with them, do mm -hmm. the things with them. We um, did without 
things growing up, but we have a lot of family memories. Mm -hmm. so. In, in the, in the thousands of people that I've met as I've gone from home to home doing preventative maintenance and whatever on people's machines, I have run into a tremendous number of people that had m mothers that had, um, had a desire to actually be there and, and raise their kids. And that's nothing against the ones that don't have a way to do that. But yeah. many times the machine and the business from home allows you to, to have the income that you need and want and have the lifestyle that you want of being able to be there with the kids. I, I think for those that want it, it's there, you know, Yes. but it's a lot of hard work. I don't want to gloss over that. <laughs> No. And you know what, you've got to be self motivated to, to do this and to run it as a business, you know, um, you've got to have the creativity, you've got to, like you said, you've got to be uh, um, self motivated, you cannot procrastinate when people bring quilts, and they want them done in a timely manner, they don't want to have to wait three months or a year, or three years to get their quilt back They're, mm -hmm. You know, they're excited and they, and but they wanted quality work too. Mm -hmm. So these days, about how many hours per week do you spend quilting for others? Since I have my second machine, I can say I probably am doing, um, I don't know, 35, 50 hours a week, depending. Um, when I just had the one machine, I would be up at five and there'd be times when I'd go until 11 midnight. And um, especially after our kids had left and gone on to college and so forth. It was a lot of, and um, it's hard to have a home life when you're doing that. So mm -hmm. Dean was for it to get the second machine and it's freed up a lot of time that I can, um, we can have more time to go mm -hmm. do family social things. and, and that. Success I'm, comes with its own problems. It's better than failure but success does come with its own problems. And the nice thing about a Statler is it's a very reliable employee. Yeah. And you know, when you're self-employed, you can choose to be as busy or as non-busy as you would like to be. Mm -hmm. So are you doing um, mostly edge to edge quilting? Do you offer custom? I offer custom. Um, custom was the bread and butter when I was getting started because there was other people that, would do the edge to edge and that's all they do. And so in order to get my foot in the door, I um, would do the custom and I'm kind of known in the area um, for my custom work. And um, a lot of um, clients I quote for will do very well at their local, um, the county fairs and the state fairs with um, lots of, lots of um, top ribbons there so that's nice to mm -hmm. get the feedback from them that but yeah, i do it mean, um, probably it means a lot to people when they get a ribbon i mean many times you know for you it's not the first ribbon on a quilt that you've quilted but many times for your customer it might be her first ribbon and that's a big deal yeah and it's nice when you've got the repeat customers that come back year after year because they know you know you can produce the quality that they expect and that when they do enter it in quilt shows, it will do well for them. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your rates? I am probably lower than the national average um, for edge to edge. I start at two cents a square inch. Denser quilting I'm is a little bit higher. Um, most people just want they're like, oh, just meander. Well, there's so much pretty patterns out there. I've got 20 some thousand patterns in my library that I've accumulated over the years. And, and um, so usually I can suggest something besides the plain meandering on that. Yeah. Part, yeah. Um, and then for custom, do you, um, do you like uh, get a photo of the quilt or whatever, and then, you know, discuss that kind of negotiate it separately or how do you, I usually like to visit with them in person on custom or heirloom quilts. And um, some of them now know 
they're like, just do whatever. And they're, they're happy with it. But I, I, some of them, I know they definitely don't like this style or they prefer this style. And, and so I, you know, I know my clients, I've got um, a good following, a lot of repeat customers. I was kind of going through quilts I've done this year. I've got over six people. I've pulled at least a dozen quilts for just mm. in this calendar year. So I, I do get a lot of repeat customers. You must be doing something back. right. Yep. Yep. Do you have any, um, any of the, sometimes people will have like a basic loading charge or a per bobbin for thread, or do you have anything like that? Or do you just stick with the square inches? I do the square inches. I have a minimum of $7 on thread charge. Um, that's to prep the bobbins and cost of thread. And then it's, I think a dollar and a half a bobbin after five bobbins and um, specialty thread. I do have some people that like um, different specialty threads that are a little more expensive. And so those are charged out proper, you know, appropriate like that. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I do require, I had a situation probably about six years ago with uh, really poor batting brought to me. So from that point on, I require that they get the batting through me. It's all through um, batting that's on a roll. Mm -hmm. um, it's you know it can be anywhere from quilter's dream to hobs to wind line um, warm and natural like you know i carry i probably carry about 20 30 different brands of batting bamboo cotton silk wool so I, wow and i have the space to care you know to store it all too so it works well yeah, most and, most quilters only have one or two different battings, and they seem to be all right with that. But the nice thing, obviously, is that you now don't have any surprises on the batting. Yes, mm -hmm. I know. I've got because your you know your work reflects on how the final quilt looks, and if you've got poor batting in it, that reflects back on your quilting services. Absolutely. So. Um, how do you have any numbers as far as how many quilts you've done in your best year ever, which was probably 2020 or what your revenue might've been in your best year? You know, I don't know that. Um, Cause it all gets handed over to the tax accountant and it's all commingled co at the end. But um, I just did a rough count this year, year to date for this year. I'm looking at around 200 quilts provided February we were gone a week on vacation March we went to Morocco for a couple weeks and didn't quilt August I hardly did any quilting we had too many family reunions and and things that we were gone here and there for so um so even so though numbers are down this year they're pretty they're pretty good considering that's definitely a number um tell me about Let's rewind to like 2010. Um, you had had your gamble for a little while. Would you have been doing like one quilt a week? That's 50 in a year. Or what would you say? I mean, that was a long time ago, but you probably have a feeling. 20, uh, 2010, I don't, you know, it's probably one to two average. Per a week. week. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, at that time, like I said, I was doing a lot more custom stuff. Custom quilts would could be on the machine for mm -hmm. five days, so yeah, that makes a big difference. And yep. and out of these two hundred, I've got I think there's about six or eight of them that are considered heirloom that went on to the state fair and and quilt shows. So um, real dense, time consuming quilts. Mm -hmm. Um, do you, um, offer any other services like binding or piecing the backings or piecing t-shirt quilts? Yes. I, um, just completed a king size t-shirt quilt. I've got to do the binding on it and a memory quilt that's smaller. I've got to do the binding on that one. Um, done crown royal quilts where I piece them and do everything from here's the bags. I need a finished quilt. And 
So yeah, I do the binding, I'll prep backings. I've even gone as far as attaching someone's border because they didn't feel comfortable attaching a border and mitering the corners. Um, have a online quilt shop and people can come here by appointment because it is located in our home for mm -hmm. fabric. I carry fabric, um, white backings, patterns, notions. Mm -hmm. Um, what was the hardest part of growing your business? You know, that I can't really you're, say because everything kind to yourself of, that it grew like, on its own, aren't it you? It just kind of grew on its own. I, I've never paid for any paid advertising with the exception of um, the All Kansas Nebraska shop. Hop has been in Nebraska, Kansas for the last two years. And just out of support for that organization, I threw an ad in, but I have never had to pay for any advertising. Um, I've also mm -hmm. done couple like quilt retreats so I do two quilt retreats a year and a jelly roll day party in September and just keep your name out there <laughs> um uh do you have a story maybe about a very meaningful quilt that somebody brought you that was more than just a quilt for The only thing I can think of is um, my mom's mom, which she passed away when I was a baby, but mom would always be telling stories about how much sewing and quilting and the things that her mom would do. And um, I don't know. I just, I started, she put me in 4-H and I was about nine, 10 years old. And it was just something I've always enjoyed doing the fabric, the sewing, quilting high school I had a job at a local fabric store it was probably a chain store that's no longer there in the Omaha area and I don't know it's just so it's in your blood it's in my blood <laughs> and why I don't know but it is I just mm -hmm. enjoy it who was your biggest cheerleader and support system as you were doing this I would probably have to say my husband Dean because um, in farming, like even with quilting, farming, there's certain times of the year you go and you're working pretty well around the clock. When there's work to be done, you do it. And um, when he had stuff going on, then I would be there to support him, get meals, run errands and stuff. And, and um, when I'm busy quilting, um, it's nice because he loves to cook. And so it's kind of, when it's a slow time for him, he's they're doing what needs to be done so I can keep doing what I love to do. Nice. That's nice. There's a lot of ladies who wish their husband would love to cook. <laughs> um, well, he loves to eat. so he <laughs> Well, there you go. <laughs> um, what kind of impact has the money from quilting and the control over your personal schedule made in your life? Um, the personal schedule, you can just, you can, uh, when the kids were younger, we, you know, if they had school activities or in college, we would like to go follow some of their, they were active in the band. And, and so we would go to some of the games and things like that. Or if they've got something going on and we want to travel and see them, we've got the freedom to pretty well come and go as we want to come and go, provided mm -hmm. that um, it doesn't conflict with the, the farming. And so... Yeah, you can schedule when a quilt is supposed to be done. You can't schedule when the hay needs to be cut. It comes when it comes. Um, what is something that you wish someone would have told you when you first started? And hold that thought because there's something that I wish I would have told people. There's a Q&A or a chat button. I'm not sure what it's called at the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question for Stephanie or for Naomi um, or for both of them, go ahead and type it in there. And um, I will get to those questions in just a few minutes. So Stephanie, my question was, um, what's something you wish someone would have told you when you first started? You 
you know, um, had I known it was going to take off like this when I started about 20 years ago, I probably would have thought more serious on um, a brick and mortar location. At one time, we kind of thought about that. There's a business, a building that was available. And um, I don't know, I just, we just didn't do, do anything. What's kind of nice having it at my home here is I can go down in my pajamas and quilt all day in my pajamas and it doesn't really matter. Um, and I don't have to get out and drive anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, it's um, a nemesis too, because then you're there working around the clock on, mm -hmm. on projects. But yeah. So um, what advice would you give to someone who wants to follow the path that you did? What, what does she need to know? Mainly, um, you've got to be very self-motivated when it's time to get things done, to get things done. Make sure you listen to your customers and know what they want in the finished product. Don't be afraid to um, fire your customer if they're not providing, um, if they're providing really wonky quilts, or at least take the time and explain how to properly attach borders, piece and square up blocks. And then if they have problems after that, um, you know, if you can't work with them, then there'll be someone else that will take those quilts on. You don't, you know, you don't have to take every single quilt that comes along. Mm. Reserving the right to refuse service. Yeah. Um, so if somebody wanted to start today her own long arm quilting business, you believe that anybody could if they want to. Is that yeah. yeah, we we did um with anything else, we did go and set up an LLC with an attorney and we do see an account on a regular basis. Um it's you know, just to and if you've got to borrow the money, make sure you're in um that you're with the banker or banking system that you, you feel comfortable that you can go in and talk to your banker like a friend at any time, because that's important to have those relationships. Those are three key Im important people to having your, um, to be able to have, you know, it's an attorney, an accountant and a banker. Cause exactly. they're going to be with you through the whole process. Mm hmm. So I've gotten a couple questions in here and uh, then I'll let you take a break once I get through these questions here. So um, Michelle asks, how do you choose a machine that you can't physically look at and touch? And that's interesting because all Gamel machines now are sold directly from Gamel um, and people don't see them and touch them before they buy them. So how did you choose a machine you couldn't look at? Well, at the, at the time I did it, there were very few options back in 09, 08. Um, you had your domestic line, which would be, you know, your smaller machines that, and then um, you had pretty much, it was just APQS and Gamble at that time were the, the um, two main machines that I could look at. I did go test drive the APQS. They didn't have the computer system at the time. And they had a smaller bobbin. They were really pushing the automatic roller advance. Um, but I thought if I'm going to be changing a bobbin, you know, four times across the quilt, a small quilt, that was not what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, when I, and I did, like I said, I did go look at a friend's um, machine and you can tell the steel rollers um, were going to be, heavy duty. The one I had was like an aluminum, um, the other machine, the aluminum shower curtain rod. And, mm -hmm. and, um, you get warpage on that after a short time and then your quilts are distorted. So mm -hmm. I was, I, I guess I wanted to go with the top end of the machines. And mm -hmm. so. Well, these days there's things like Google reviews and things like that, but uh, you kind of did that when you went to see your friend's machine, right? It was like, well, it worked for her, so it's going to work for yeah. you. Um, Joyce asks, Stephanie, what's the name of your website? 
The website is countryviewquilting.com. We live in the country. We have a nice country view out the window <laughs> and quilting. So, yeah. Um, Sandy asks, uh, do you notice a difference between your Statler and Ascend? There, it's smoother. Um, it seems to quilt out faster. I tend to use the Ascend most of the time for all my custom work because I do have the hydraulics and all the bells and whistles on my Ascend. Um, the Statler, I've got the light bar. Um, I don't have the hydraulics on that one because I figured I'd be doing all my edge to edge on, on the Statler. So mm -hmm. I may, I may upgrade to the Ascend sometime. I just have been busy and it hasn't been on the top of my priority list to consider doing that. Sure. You're keeping them busy. Um, this is a great one. Um, I don't have a name. It just says anonymous, but how do you stay motivated after being in business for 20 years? Every quilt is different. It's not, um, in, in the late to mid nineties, my husband and I developed a soy bean candle oil candle, and it was fun during the development stage of that. But once we got into the production stage, it was like working in an assembly line and it was monotonous. And we, someone was after it, so we sold that off. And um, with quilts, every, even if you get two quilts in that are identical, because two, pe you know, two friends made the same quilt, but they want them quilted different. Everything is different. There's, there's yet to been two identical quilts that were quilted identically. Mm -hmm. so it's just. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, stay with us because okay. we'll still have questions come in. Um, I love your story. Uh, we're going to switch gears over here to Naomi. I got a question in the Q and a that was related to you, which is that somebody missed, uh, where you're from, where you live. And I believe you said it was Ferndale, Washington, correct? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I know near, where that uh, is. That's near you? where I used to come from. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm uh, oh yeah. You were over Eastern Washington, right? Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I always like people don't know where Ferndale is. So, but a lot of people know where Bellingham, Washington is. So yeah, I'm just, yeah, I'm, it's a, it's a big port of entry between Canada and the United States. So, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, um, how long have you been long arm quilting? So I got my first machine two years ago in July. So not very long. Um, yeah. And it's really taken off. Mm -hmm. What made you decide to do this? So I've always loved quilting, piecing quilts, and I really wanted to get a long arm about 12 years ago, but my husband convinced me to get an embroidery machine instead of a long arm. He's like, oh, do embroidery, then you can pay for the long arm, which I am thankful that I went that route first because... It allowed me to look around and find the gamble. I don't think I would have been happy with getting a domestic long arm. I know I wouldn't have been happy. And so over the last five years, I really kind of, you know, got a lot of information, went out there, saw you guys at, you know, so expos and conventions and that type of stuff. So. Mm -hmm. So when you got your, um, embroidery machine the idea was to use it to make money did you get your long arm specifically for that as well yes yeah you know i i have it built in my brain where it's like you know oh i'm doing this can i make money doing this and i just i look at everything i do like could this be an opportunity so i definitely knew i wanted to quilt for people and it when I got my machine, it was at a perfect point because my friend who had a long arm machine retired that was local. And then another long armor moved out of the area. So wow. they lost two long armors. There are still a few others in the area. So that really helped. 
Yeah. So you had people actively looking, who am I going to get to quilt my quilts now that Marcy has retired? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm hmm. So um, why did you choose a gamel? So, you know, my husband's really into like, we need to buy the best quality out there. You know, you get what you pay for. So doing our research and just seeing that parts are metal, there's no plastic components, you know, it's strong, it's sturdy, it's going to last. Um, you have great warranty, great customer service, and those were key elements. Hmm. Wow, I'll have to send you a check later for all those good things. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth, you know, it's it the is. truth. Yes. Um, so uh, you got a Statler right out of the gate then. You started with a Statler. Yep. Yeah, okay. I started with a 14-foot frame and... She's been wonderful. She's worked like a dream. Um, and I would not change it. Mm -hmm. So uh, you do have the same one today, but then you added a second machine. Tell me yeah. about that decision. Yeah. So after the first year, I was finding myself, you know, five in the morning up quilting um, and it was just long days, 12 hour days and trying to get as many quilts done for people as possible. And I told myself if I am going to do this long term, I don't want to lose my weekends at some point. I like to have my weekends, like not always. I'm, I'm okay with doing a rush here and there on weekends, but I really want to get more time back. So that was the determ determ determination of, okay, work harder so I can save up enough money to get a second long arm. Mm -hmm. And so the discussion within your household about that was pretty straightforward because obviously you were working night and day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, t I said, if I have at least... X amount of quilts on the queue for, you know, six to eight months, it's time to get a second machine. You know, if you have so many backlog, it just makes sense to add a second machine. Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, you knew there was enough long arm business available um, because had those other couple ladies retired from quilting before you got your machine or it, it was about the same time? So the one, my friend that retired, she um, actually, um, she's been, she was quilting, I think for 25 years. And I think her robotics said good night. And so she was like, I'm well, I'm like a year away from retiring. So I'm not going to replace anything. I'm just retiring. And she was my long armor. Mm -hmm. So then once she told me she was done, I, within a week, I ordered my gamel. I said, okay, this is a sign. I need to do it. And then the other gal, she moved out of state probably six months before that. So she was already gone. So people were hurting uh, when people were first coming to me to find someone to long arm. They were just so happy they found me and um they would bring me five to 10 quilts in mm -hmm. one go. And it was just amazing. And I was like, okay, <laughs> let's do this. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like you were in the right place at the right time. Yes. Yeah. There, there does seem to be a pattern though, that many times people, their business will start out and they gain customers and it, it goes like this and then it plateaus. And then at some point they're like, older and going to a lot more doctor's appointments and yeah. wanting to spend time with their grandkids. Mm -hmm. And so they start tapering off and, and only doing the quilts for their favorite customers. And that makes room for some fresh faced young quilter to come in and, mm -hmm. and uh, make a name for herself. How did you come up with the funds to purchase your machine? Was it from the money you made from your embroidery machine? Yes. For the first machine, I just, 
did my embroidery and screen printing. And then I was an educator at my local sewing and vacuum store. So I was just saving up money and I was able to save up half. And then I got a loan for the other half and I paid that off within the first year of quilting. Mm -hmm. And then for the second machine, I told myself I'd only get it if I could pay cash. So then I just worked, worked, worked and was able to pay cash for the second machine. There's an incentive to work extra those long hours. Yep. Yeah. Um, how long was it that you were doing your your other job at the sewing store uh, before you did quilting full time? Oh, well, I was only an educator, so I worked my own hours. I never worked in the store. So mm. I would I would put on trunk shows and a couple times a year. Um the sewing store has 14 locations. I would travel around to their locations and put on trunk shows. And I still do that too. And, you know, it's, it worked out well because now when I travel around, I show the quilts that I'm, you know, I've made and go, and I quilted it. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a, you know, win-win. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, you'd pick up some new customers that way for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I started doing the embroidery and the education about 12 years ago. And then two years ago was when I introduced the long arm into all of it. Gotcha. Okay. So how many hours a week with those two machines do you spend doing quilting for customers? So I've only had it a few weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and I've spent the last couple of weeks, like just knocking them out to see like, how many can I do in a day, you know? And uh, Stephanie knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> but how many can you do in a day? Um, well, I've done eight mm -hmm. de decent sized quilts in a day. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you can do so many little quilts in a day. Um, but the goal is, you know, to work like an eight to 10 hour day. Because it varies because you have customers that, you know, pick up, drop off, and those take chunks of your day. So, um, but I'm, I'm getting, I think, more manageable now that it's going to be about eight hour days. I'm, I'm getting my, my backlog, my queue down. So that make it's making me happy. Mm -hmm. That's got to feel good. Mm -hmm. So are you doing some custom quilting in between the edge to edges? I started about a year ago doing custom, so I probably do 80% edge to edge, 20% custom. Mm -hmm. And that was another reason I ended up getting the second long arm because it's, it can tie up your machine and you still want to be moving those edge to edges along because they're just, they can be very easy and quick and you can get a, you know, quite a few done in one day. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, in Ferndale, you're in an area maybe with slightly higher quilting rates. How do you have your rates structured? Um, so I went off my friend that retired and I do two cents a square inch for edge to edge. And since I'm still newer to the custom, my prices are pretty low. And it's really just based on quilt. To, every quilt's different because some people just want edge to edge in the middle with a border pattern. And then other people want, you know, every block. So that kind of just varies for prices. Mm -hmm. but, well, I, um, I'm not in the business of giving advice, but I'll give it anyway. <laughs> um, you're going to find out that when you raise your rates a little bit, that nothing changes except the amount that people write on the check. Yeah. I mean, everything else stays the same mm -hmm. except the $180 quilt becomes a $190 quilt, but you'll do that when you're ready to, um, do you have, um, a minimum or a loading fee or a thread charge or any of that? So I do a $40 minimum. Um, but I don't have any loading fee or bobbin or thread fee. Okay. Um, do you have any numbers for how many quilts 
or how much revenue you did in your best year, which is maybe this year. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't have revenue. I have how many quilts I did. My mm -hmm. first, my first year I did 350 uh, quilts. And then this second year I just did um, was 500 quilts. Mm -hmm. Good so numbers. On, yeah. So now I'm on my third year because I mean, I do my taxes, you know, regular years, but I, when I track how many quilts I do from actually when I started quilting for people. So it's September through September. Mm. So. Yeah. Good, good numbers. Um, do you uh, have supplies like batting wide backs and do you do things like uh, binding and those sorts of things? Yeah, for batting, I carry four different types. I carry warm and natural, hobs, bamboo, and a wool blend. And then I also have around 50 bolts of Shannon 90-inch Minky. I love quilting on Minky. A lot of my customers come to me because other ladies in my area will not quilt, cuddle, Minky. So mm -hmm. I will. <laughs> Um, and then I do binding. Um, I offer machine binding and hand binding. I will piece backings if they need me to take apart a quilt, fix a border if I need to, um, you know, anything to, you know, and my mom always says, so my mom helps me out a little bit. She moved in with us about five years ago and she's afraid of the technology, <laughs> but she will load quilts. So she loves to load quilts and that has Fantastic. been amazing. So she, um, yeah, so she'll load the quilts and she'll help with binding. Um, but yeah, so. Mm -hmm. I was terrified the first time I was teaching a lady how to use her brand new Statler. This was back in the days when people didn't know how to use their Statler on the day of delivery. They had to wait until, I got there to set it up and deliver it. And so anyway, we're there doing her first quilt together and she pulls out the quilt because um, she had to supply it back then. And it had a minky backing. And I happened to be in Canada at the time. And I, um, I uh, called a teacher uh, and I said, all I know about minky is that you have to load it the right way, but which way I can't remember. So, of course, now, of course, we have all that in the new owner training, but I was, um, she said, oh, don't worry about it. Cutting it is a lot worse than loading it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. It has a mind of its own. <laughs> <laughs> and and not all minky and cuddle are equally friendly. Mm -hmm. So what was the hardest part of growing your business? I mean, it wasn't finding customers. No. Um, you know, honestly, for the long arm, it wasn't it wasn't the long arm business because I already had my own business that I I went through all the struggles with of just like balancing, you know, home and work. I mean, that's always a struggle, I think, like, you know, making sure you say, OK, today I am stopping at five o'clock and that's OK. So I think that's probably the hardest struggle, I think, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any change in technology that makes it easier today than when you started? Uh, I was, I should have asked Stephanie that question too. You only started a couple of years ago. So I don't know if there's, if you have an answer for that. No, I mean, I, I got my machine during the time everything was transitioning with the company. Um, so that was, you know, a little different. But then this year I went to Quilting with Confidence in Minnesota. I decided I wasn't going to wait to go to the <laughs> one that's local to me because I was impatient and wanted to go get education, more education. And then I went on the Alaskan cruise. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, I wouldn't say anything's changed, but like I always tell people education, it's so important. Go get it, absorb it, just take it all in. Mm -hmm. 
So who has been your biggest cheerleader and your support system? Uh, my husband, my husband, Travis, he's, you know, he has always supported me. And when he, well, when we moved here and he was like, I want you to stay home. I don't want you to work. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but then I got bored and I started sewing and he's always been like, whatever you need, I'm here for you. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, every human needs purpose. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah, you can't just watch soap operas all day. Um, <laughs> so what kind of impact has the quilting money and the control of your personal schedule made in your life? It's been really nice. Um, you know, going from working full time and then being a stay at home mom, um, it's a transition and it's been nice because I think the first thing I did after my first holiday season was I surprised my husband with um, an all-inclusive trip to Mexico. And he was so uh, proud of me and he was just so happy. So it's, it's those fun little things. And then talking about retirement and, you know, um, we have two kids, one 19 and one 14. So it's like, you know, they're slowly moving, going to be moving out the second one. She's in high school and just looking forward to the next chapter. And and the money has helped with that because then now we can really plan um, schedule wise. It's been great because if I'm home and my kid calls me at school and they need something, and as long as I don't have a customer coming over, I can run and take her something. So it's I could never do that when I was working outside the home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is something that you wish someone would have told you when you first started? Um, not every quilt is going to be easy, <laughs> but hang in there. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who wants to do what you've done? You know... Fear can hold us back. And I would say, don't run from it. Like, just take it in and always ask questions. You know, I'm a big believer in fear, I think can control us too much. So let's, you know, I try not to let it control me. So I just, I tell people, just do it. What's the worst case scenario? You're going to be in the same boat. So just try. Mm hmm. Hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, Lorna asks if you get a lot of Canadian customers. I do. I mean, I get a variety of customers, probably about 10% are my Canadian customers. Um, a lot of them, the ones I do have like it, uh, they like coming to me because they can sometimes get a deal depending on how the Canadian dollar is to the U S dollar. Um, so yeah, I, I've got some great Canadian customers. I love when they come down and, uh, they're always so friendly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you might be able to get them to bring you something across the border. They have, um, they have Heinz ketchup over there. That's no corn syrup. It's real sugar. Oh, okay. So you can, you can get stuff. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yep. And they come here and they get our milk and gas. That's right. <laughs> Um, fantastic. Um, uh, that's, that's all the questions I have. I really, really appreciate you guys sharing your stories. Um, and, um, I am constantly inspired by quilters like yourself that have, um, faced their fears and gone ahead and did something anyway. And obviously you've had challenges along the way that doesn't happen without some obstacles. But um, I, I believe that your stories will definitely help people. And I really appreciate that. Um, I would ask you to do us a favor. Our podcast is new. And I know if you're on the webinar, you don't even know about the podcast. But on the podcasting platforms like Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts, um, you can subscribe. And it'll automatically download new episodes to your phone. 
And the other thing you can do, and this would really help us because we're new, would be to just um, go ahead and give it five stars and then write a few lines about it. And um, right now we have no reviews. So, um, but if you can't give us a five star one, just don't bother. So, <laughs> but I think today is a five star review day. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie and Naomi, for joining with, with us today. And I hope I see a lot of you guys back here next week for our next episode. Thank you. I was going to say too, we've got, we've got the Facebook pages too, like Gamel has. So, you know, if you're following, go like the, the Facebook groups and join those. Yes. Uh, we have um, three Facebook groups, but the two biggest ones are the Statler owners group and the general Gamel owners group. And even though they are labeled as owners groups, if you don't own a machine, you can still join. You'll be allowed to, you just have to answer the little questions. And when it asks, who did you buy your machine from? Just say, well, I haven't bought one yet, but I'm thinking about it. Those Russian scammers don't know how to answer those questions. <laughs> Nobody tell them. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. And I really appreciate the, the wisdom you had to share with everybody today. Have a nice evening. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Good night. Night. Bye.